Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Gigi Elbayumi, and I am the founding director of the Rodham Institute, and this is the Rodham Institute's Impact Speaker Series. Welcome, and uh, I'm just so excited about tonight's program because it's the beat goes on, what sort of you need to know about heart health in the middle of uh, the pandemic. We've got an incredible group of people uh, that are going to join us. Dr. Reginald uh, Robinson, who is a dear friend and a cardiologist and member of the Association of Black Cardiologists. And by the way, this is to kick off our um, Heart Health Month, uh, which begins in February 1st. We are also really lucky to have uh, Ms. Priscilla Das, who is a Nutrition, nutrition uh, Services Director from our beloved Food and Friends. And I'm just gonna plug Food and Friends a little bit. Food and Friends is one of my favorite organizations in the city, and they've been working really, really hard during this pandemic. They've always worked hard. What started as an organization to serve people living with AIDS, um, then extended to care for meals and bring meals to people living with cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and now with people who have sort of progressive uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as um, Parkinson's. And what's so wonderful about this program, it's actually not income-based, it's need-based, which means that if a person gets the, um, the, the qualifies for the program, you get excellent meals, I've tasted them. And not only that, you can get meals that are for your whole family because we know that if you, you know, feed one person who's the patient and there isn't enough food for everybody else, what's gonna happen? It's gonna get split among the fours. And Ms. Priscilla is gonna correct me, I believe it's uh, four uh, family members. But there's another program that they started in conjunction with AmeriHealth that's amazing. And that is a program with um, uh, uh, Mira Health called Bright Start for pregnant women. So please, please, please go to their website, learn more, and also go to Dr. Robinson's um, website and learn about him and the Association for Black Cardiologists. So before we kind of get into the meat of what we'll be discussing, maybe meat is not a good analogy, maybe the fruits and vegetables, right? <laughs> Um, I'd like to talk a little bit with you about COVID because um, COVID has decimated the African-American community. So we, oh, we, we um, have about 85% of the deaths in the Washington DC area are actually among African-Americans. And per capita in the country, we now are number seven in the country. Uh, but that doesn't even tell the whole story. Um, when we're looking at sort of the social determinants of COVID, and I know that Dr. Robinson is going to talk about the social determinants of heart disease. And of course, um, one of the issues is food that, of course, Ms. Priscilla is going to talk with us about, is that it's not simply the testing or the masks or the vaccinations. Those are all super important. And actually with this new variant that's coming from South Africa that's gonna spread and is already in the United States that's gonna spread through our communities like wildfire. All those things become exceedingly important. But what's sad and what's so important to understand is when we're dealing with one issue um, such as COVID, first of all, that actually serves as a model for how we should tackle every other disease, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, mental health. And in tackling this issue, some of the things that people are really, really struggling with, people are starving to death in the United States and in Washington, DC. And they're also sadly committing suicide. And so what Ms. Carter um, from the Rodham Institute has put up um, for you to see is the COVID-19 and Beyond series. And that's tomorrow at 12 and it's for kids, it's, it's in collaboration with um, our partners, the Children's National, the Black Coalition Against COVID. I hope you'll be able to join us. So before I just sort of introduce the guests, one more thing that I wanna tell you. The Rodham Institute is a member of the Black Coalition Against COVID. I hope you'll go and visit the site. It's blackcoalitionagainstcovid.org, which is now being housed under our other partner, blackdoctor.org. The thing about this coalition is it's a coalition that includes all four of the historically black 
medical schools, labor, faith-based, of course, healthcare, including nurses, pharmacists, et cetera, but also teachers. And who did I, who did I leave out? Community leaders, the Greek and you know, sororities and fraternities, African-American that is. And what you'll see on the website is really information, information about COVID, information about the vaccines, I believe that Black Coalition Against COVID, as well as so many wonderful organizations, have really taken the lead to, you know, reduce uh, vaccine reluctance, and we're seeing the numbers improve. The only group that it's not really improving with are actually youth, so that's why you know we're trying to um, to focus on educating youth. So without further ado, because we could do a whole story just about what's happening with COVID, we want to make sure, can you go back to that previous slide, Ms. Carter? Because I don't want to forget this one. So Rodham is recruiting for high school students and tomorrow we've got our help information session. So what's help is the health education and leadership program. And um, it actually started, we started it before Rodham was Rodham. As a matter of fact, Dr. Robinson was part of a panel of African-American physicians, two cardiologists I remember, a nephrologist, I can't remember what the fourth person was. So please uh, sign up, this is a great program. We actually have 100% rate of kids graduating from high school and going to community college, college or university. So please, please join us. All right, next slide. Please visit our website. Next slide. And just to review our three priority areas, you heard about workforce for youth, the training, the current and health, future health professionals in what I call applied health equity, which you know, everybody's just discovered health equity, right? For people who've been working in this space for decades, it's not anything new. But what we're focused in Rodham is about solutions and really applications. And so that's why our community collaborations with over 200 groups are so key, such as Food and Friends. Um, here are some of the resources. Go to our website and please visit them and uh, feel free to tweet out about Rodham. And I just want to introduce our wonderful staff. Ms. Tracy Bass is now the Director of Doctors of Tomorrow and Workforce Pipeline Programs. Doctors of Tomorrow is actually from my alma mater, University of Michigan and it's for 10th graders and we're working with the Health Sciences Academy and she's doing that full time. Ms. Christina Williams is just amazing. Uh, she is the Director of Community Engagement and she's helped to bring meals, homemade masks and support uh, to our communities. And finally, last but not least is Ms. Ashanti Carter who's the Director of the Health Program and Program Manager. She helps to bring us together for these wonderful um, webinars and to help organize them. So, you know, we're, we had last week, it was um, uh, COVID uh, and disparities uh, during COVID for the deaf and hard of hearing community. So there are, um, you know, webinars on subjects that you're not seeing, please shoot us an email through Rodham and let's keep in touch. All righty, I think we're ready. So we've kept, our, um, <laughs> we've kept our panelists in the green room all this time. So without further ado, what I'd like to be able to have our panelists do is to just introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about themselves. So I think I'll start with you, Dr. Robinson. Welcome. Welcome, uh, Dr. Albayumi, one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, my name is- Back Reginald. at you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a practicing non-invasive cardiologist in Washington, DC and um, working with MedStar cardiology associates for 20 years in practice here in DC. I'm an undergrad at, did my undergrad at Morehouse uh, College in Atlanta and uh, medical school at Howard and then moved on up to Temple for my internal medicine and cardiology. Um, been involved in the community for many, many years. I'm on the board of the um, Greater Washington American Heart Association, past president of that board and now president of LEC of the Eastern States Board of the American Heart Association, which covers 33 local boards from Virginia up to Maine and West Virginia. So sort of the face of um, helping to organize these wonderful 33 boards up and down the East Coast. And you don't look worse for the wear, Dr. Robinson. You always look great, really, truly. And going. 
Dr. Robinson, I think that you can see by his manner is one of the most humble and modest human beings who really walks the walk and you know, community involvement and, and, and serving the community in the various capacities is not something that he's just come lately to. This is who he is as a human being. So we are so excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. And uh, Ms. Daz, Ms. Priscilla Daz is from Food and Friends. How did you like the advertisement that I gave you guys? I'm not getting any money, right? <laughs> no, not, no money. Um, thank well, you welcome. for mentioning the organization. Um, I've, uh, I'm the Nutrition Services Director at Food and Friends. As mentioned earlier, um, we provide medically tailored meals and nutrition counseling to folks living with chronic illness in the DMV. Um, I lead a great team of dietitians who help our clients daily in symptom management and I'm um, helping them through um, nutrition related issues and uh, it's very re rewarding work and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having yes, me. Of course and we're going to talk about food um, uh, but let's just start off with sort of before COVID because it's I think important for our audience to know really how you know, we in the Washington DC actually lead the country per capita. We're number one and not in a good way in HIV, cancer mortality and stage kidney disease, right? And we know that there are concentrations of these issues in wards five, seven and eight, particularly ward eight. So Dr. Robinson, I mean, talk to us about what are the, rate, the, the structural and social determinants of health when it comes to heart disease. So if you can put the first slide up, just two brief slides will help to, uh, so your zip code, this, I put this up, this is very important. Your zip code and race shouldn't determine how long you live, but they do. In fact, health, is in more, health has more to do with race and place than doctor's visits. Next slide. So this is a map of Washington, DC, our lovely city. So if you look at the bottom, the bright red Southeast DC, but based on zip code, all of those, if you go on and look up the uh, Elijah Wolfson maps, there's a Time, art Time Magazine article, they have maps of DC, Chicago, and New York, it's fascinating. And if you hover over each one of these zip codes, it'll give you six variables. So the red is a, a life expectancy of 65 years of age down the bottom in the upper, in the Northwest corridor, the life expectancy closer to 90 years of age in the same city. And when you hover over each one of those areas, I'm just gonna look at some of the parameters that comes up. Looks at that red zip code all the way at the bottom is 20032, life expectancy, 72.2 years. Unemployment, sorry, something just happened with the, uh, let me pull you back up here, just clicked off. We can hear you and we can see everything fine. Okay, it just, my screen just went away. Oh, uh, well, we see you. 72.2 <laughs> 2 years, unemployment rate, 17%. Uninsured rate, 7.5%. Rate of limited access to healthy foods, 24.5%. Obesity rate, 37.5%. Share of adults who smoke, 32.4%. Uh, and if you go up all the way up to the top, zip code 20012, in upper Northwest on the other side of the park, life expectancy almost 20 years difference or 10 to 15 years rather of 83.3 years, unemployment rate only 5%, uninsured rate only 4.4%, rate of limited access to healthy foods, um, it's 50%, but I, I don't believe that particular stat that far. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Obesity rate is much lower, 23%, and adults who smoke is lower, 9.3%. So something's happening in the same city. And that zip code is a powerful predictor of health. Those are some of the non-modifiable risk factors. We talk about food and um, activity, but these are the things that encompass the social determinants of health, these non-traditional risk factors, zip code, housing, where do you live? How is housing impacting your quality of life? Do you live in a place where it's not safe to go outside to exercise? Do you live in a place where the environment is uh, you have a lot of blight and terrible air quality, environmental policing. That's a stressful situation as we know in our environments and how that impacts someone in that zip code 
in the lower quadrant of our city versus the upper northwest quadrant of our city. Unemployment rate, how that has huge impact on health throughout the, the spectrum, whether it's cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, cancer risk, impacts the whole health, uh, uh, health uh, outlook. And food insecurities, everyone talks about food desert, but that's a part of it. Huge part when you start looking at legislation and thinking about PSEs or policy system and environmental changes that needs to be uh, influenced. So cardiovascular disease has been the leading cause of death since the, uh, the early 1900s when we had our first plague. And now it's still the, the leading cause up until our second plague, which is COVID. So there is something that we're not doing right and pulling in the right people to actually help influencing some of these policy system and environmental changes that we need to occur. So thank you, Dr. Robinson. I mean, I think what's not right is racism and poverty. I mean, I think, and actually the most recent data that um, came out of the uh, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, um, in conjunction with the Kaiser Family Foundation, there's an excellent study called Uneven Opportunities. So actually, I'm sorry to correct you, but it's actually the span in terms of life expectancy is even worse. So if you live in Georgetown uh, within sort of uh, the various wards, and my cat is here, so if the thing gets knocked down, you'll know why, um, you, your life expectancy on average is 94. But if you live in Anacostia, it's actually uh, 65, 66 and a half. So the gap is uh, almost 27 years. And that's, I think, one of the highest per capita gaps in the country. And that doesn't even really speak about quality of life. I mean, it's just a number. I mean, you could live to 94 and, and you know, be demented or have you know, a, a neurologic devastating disease, or you can live and you know, die at 25 because of gun violence, right? And so, or, or live to 65 and be, have mental health issues, which by the way, I'm seeing a lot of in my patients these days. So um, Ms. Das, please talk to us about uh, sort of, again, pre-COVID, can you share with us some of the issues and statistics perhaps about food insecurity? And what does food, what are food deserts? What's the difference? Food deserts, food swamps, food insecurity. Can you, can you enlighten and educate us please? Sure, just to um, echo uh, a lot of what was what Dr. Robinson was saying, there is obvious, some very obvious disparities between different wards and where we even see where grocery stores are and available um, food, fresh food um, options for residents of certain areas of DC. Um, a food desert is just that. It's, you know, we you don't see a lot of available options. Um, oftentimes they are, folks have to go to their local gas stations or bodegas in order to get um, food. And usually it's not, you know, um, fresh, fresh items. Um, you know, food insecurity has been an, an issue, an ongoing issue in this area, but COVID has just exacerbated that. A lot of people are, you know, uh, there's financial implications around um, employment and um, caring for children and also, um, you know, ill loved ones. So we are seeing an uptick of, of folks who are not just dealing with food insecurity now, but also uh, financial related issues due to COVID. So um, yeah, we are definitely seeing that difference since, um, since all of this started. Mm -hmm. And although when it comes to food, you know, our focus just because of uh, how many people are impacted on that is usually wards five, seven, and eight. But I know that in ward three, there are seniors who are food insecure and the food insecurity more relates to them not being able to get out mm -hmm. and certainly social isolation these days is real is a real issue so for people who have never been to ward eight um, i will tell you that there's only one giant um, and there's also a lot of mythology that oh african americans don't like to only like junk food and don't like fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. so what i like to remind people about is that anacostia used to be uh, I mean, sorry, not Anacostia, Berry Farm used to be the Berry Farm tobacco plantation. And after the Emancipation Proclamation, the um, freedmen were given about 400 acres, which they transformed into a very active farming community. And what they then did 
is they would go after the tilt the fields and you know all that they would walk to where Howard is because guess what they built Howard and moreover at the heyday of, of Berry Farm uh, which by the way is not it's not named for the late Marion Berry although that would be fine too um, that at its heyday uh, one in four people adults were attending university. Now one in four are in the prison system. So, um, uh, so DC Greens, uh, one of my other favorite organizations because Capital Area Food Bank, so others may eat, uh, Martha's Table, all these are just amazing organizations. So DC Greens actually created a program called, uh, I think Healthy Corner Stores. And if I'm wrong, Ms. Priscilla, please jump in because sometimes I get the names muddled. Um, and basically what they said is they said to the people of corner stores, don't worry, we'll bring the fruit and fruits and vegetables. We'll be in charge of, you know, selling them. And guess what? We'll give you the profit. Guess how long it took to sell the, the, the merchandise? One hour. So Dr. Robinson, I mean, please help us out because there's a lot of sort of stereotypes that exist about the African-American community and other communities, right? The Latinx, uh, so forth when it comes to diet and, and heart disease. Can you enlighten us on what the reality is and what people are doing? Well, I think it's all about exposure and, you know, some of their, there are some cultural influences in the way we eat and Latino Americans, it's how we eat is, you know, is one of those things that don't go out of your grandmother's kitchen without cleaning your plate. You know, that <laughs> try to love you to death, <laughs> right? So versus looking at, you know, and, and the stigma of if you're losing weight, something must be wrong with you. you must have oh, HIV yes. or you have cancer or something's wrong with you. And it, I tell my patients that it's usually the people that are telling you that that are ill. When you look at the mm. two thirds of the population of being obese, um, when you do the right thing and someone says, oh, you look sick and patients and people are actually saying, I don't want to look sick. Like, don't worry about that. You can build up the flat flabby tissue by doing some light weights or something to help build up more muscle mass mm. and getting over the concept that you don't have to be wealthy to eat correctly mm -hmm. or, or and, you know I just give them simple rules of rule of thumb to minimize some of the starchy foods that we traditionally love to eat and to um, because it's generally that's generally cheaper white rice white potatoes white pasta versus giving yourself more color mm -hmm. I try to treat, uh, you know, try to go to uh, go to people where they are, meet them where they are. If I go and tell someone they need to be a vegetarian, I've lost them already. Mm -hmm. So there's no need for me to even do that or quote mm -hmm. disrespect them by saying that. But most people can do a hybrid of that. Mm -hmm. Pick three or four days a week where it's just going to be their plant-based day, and get them used to it, ease them into it that way. And when they come back, they're like, "Hey, I lost." 10 pounds and they're proud of it. And they said, you know, it's not that hard to do. So getting some of, getting rid of some of the stigmas, the stereotypes, the traditional things that we've had, I had it. And yeah. uh, you know, the things that I still love that I know I have to just modify. Mm -hmm. So how did your education impact sort of, you mentioned that you had in terms of your upbringing and your habits. Can you share that with us? Well. I think exposure, that's the biggest impact that education, income allows you to do, to be able to see other things, to be able to eat different foods, to be able to try things and not be confined in one particular area. You know, so many people that won't try anything because they, they wanna stick in their usual space. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard mm -hmm. to get people, well, I won't eat anything that's green. I mm -hmm. had a, a medical assistant who I, I bring in fruits and different, you know, different things to the office and said she never ate purple grapes. She's only had green grapes because that's all wow. her mother had. And, and she wow. was in her late thirties. Yeah. Just some basic fruit that I thought was common. It really wasn't. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, just exposure, that, that exposure, the being able to go to different places and to eat different things was really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Priscilla, I know that you have um, about 10 different menus 
uh, and there are, you can mix and match up to three kind of conditions. Let's say somebody's got diabetes and heart failure and kidney disease. So what would that meal plan look like? Because people are like, oh, this is Meals on Wheels, but these are ta tailored to the taste of people. Can you tell us more? Sure. So yes, uh, we have 11 different meal plans and we all of this is planned um, between the dietitians and the chefs. Everything is medically tailored per um, illness. So, you know, everything is freshly made in house. We really have an emphasis on whole grains, fruits and vegetables, um, you know, trying to meet people where, where they are. Again, we don't want to uh, kind of impose too many things that may be foreign to some of our clients we want. So we do gauge um, client feedback with our foods. I'm trying to be more culturally inclusive of things that they would be wanting to eat. Um, but we, you know, we, it's all cooked in house. It's all freshly made. And uh, we, we really have a pattern after the Mediterranean diet. So mm -hmm. a lot more fish items, um, fruits and vegetables, whole grains and fruits. What's that? Well, yeah, and it's delicious. I can attest to that. Yeah. <laughs> and you. for people who don't necessarily need meal preparation, you actually uh, can supply the produce and the dry goods. So if, if somebody can't, you know, it's a matter of not being able to get out, right? That you will bring whatever they would like to them. Exactly. So the, with the two services are the home delivered meals piece, which um, you know, is pretty much heat and heat and eat, very minimal to no preparation. Um, and then the grocery service, which you just mentioned, uh, for people who have a bit more mobility and can cook their own meals, um, fresh produce, uh, good lean sources of protein and dried goods. So two great services um, helping people out. Okay. And I see that Ms. Carter has put a shout out for anybody that has any questions. You, this is a perfect time to ask. Um, Dr. Robinson, let's now focus uh, a little bit more on- Ms. Das? Yes. How, how can someone get to use your service? Because you know we're in the sick care system, not really the healthcare system. Right, and right. People are paid for sick care. You go see your doctor, you give a test, you give a medication, you do this, you do that. You usually don't see getting uh, so a prescription for a meal plan, mm -hmm. but I know there's an opportunity that's out there some kind of way. I hope you can educate me and others on how to get someone to you and make it so that they don't have to pay for it or that it becomes more incentivized for the physician to enroll many of their patients in. Sure. So, um, being a dietitian, you know, we, we do tend to say we are on the more um, prevention uh, heavy side, but because of the nature of food and friends and serving people who are already ill, unfortunately, we're catching them after a diagnosis. Uh, so in order to receive services, um, an individual must be referred by a medical provider or a case manager or a social worker. Um, attesting to their compromised nutrition status and their illness. And then we, you know, take, take them through an intake process to get them um, started on services. So there is a refer a client tab on our website, um, but I encourage you to visit, visit the foodandfriends.org website for more information. Um, but again, it's entirely health-based. There's no financial parameters associated. So, um, you know, it's all free and, you know, getting the word out among uh, healthcare communities, like, you know, letting them know that we exist as a service, not, not just DC, but in Maryland and Virginia, um, so that people who are ill can be connected to our services who, who need, you know, the home delivered meals. And so that's why this webinar is so important is to try to get the word out. Uh, and that's why actually at the Rodden Institute, we have an education council where Food and Friends is represented, where Arts for the Aging is represented, where Children's is represented, people from the mental health community that can really inform the curriculum that we have for our trainees, because these are the things that actually impact people's lives. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Robinson, please educate us on the modifiable uh, risk factors uh, when it comes to heart disease and the types of heart disease. So when you think about modifiable risk factors, those are things that you can do. Um, your sedentary, your lifestyle activity and your diet, as well as you can add some mental health in there because mental health really has an impact on a whole host of cardiovascular disease. When you think about cardiovascular disease, most people have heard of, it's an umbrella term that encompasses uh, heart attacks, strokes, 
peripheral vascular disease, or what we call, quote, poor circulation, um, hypertension or high blood pressure, high cholesterol. You may have seen commercials for atrial fibrillation and people putting, being put on blood thinners. And you could also really include diabetes as a cardiovascular, quote, risk equivalent. Because if you have diabetes, you're four times more likely to have a, a stroke, heart attack, end up on dialysis or an amputation. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop you there. Can mm -hmm. you say that again? Because that is such important information. The diabetes can cause what kind of risk for heart disease and all these other things? You, you should treat diabetes as aggressively as someone with known coronary disease or heart attacks. It's called a cardiac equivalent, meaning that you're probably four times or more likely to have a stroke, heart attack, end up on dialysis, or have an amputation. It's the leading cause of amputation, and smoking is the second cause of a preventable disease. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned mental health and heart disease. How, how, how do those two connect? Well, uh, one of the, or there are five pillars that the Heart Association is actually focusing on. One is women in heart. You've heard of the red dress campaign that you see promoting um, cardiovascular disease in women, which one in three women will die of a cardiovascular event. So we, we help support research in that area. COVID and setting guidelines on how we follow patients that have had COVID athletes and getting back to sports and putting out the guidelines on how do you follow someone with COVID. Um, chronic conditions is uh, that encompasses mental health and food insecurity. Um, so we'll stop at that. Oh, the other two, you're looking at um, health equity. So it's a digital first equity always platform that we're looking at all of this. Mm -hmm. When you think about mental health, mental health has a huge impact on adrenaline, on the, mm -hmm. uh, these stress releasing hormones mm -hmm. um, that can promote higher blood pressure, ulceration in the stomach, um, actually can cause something called uh, Takitsubo's cardiomyopathy, where someone, in particular younger women, in stressful positions can come in with a heart attack. All the symptoms of a heart attack, the EKG looks like a heart attack. When you draw the blood work, the heart enzymes are elevated, causing that showing damage. But when you do what's called an angiogram and take pictures of the arteries, the arteries are clean. So you, you wonder what happened. And one of the theories is that there's a lot of spasm in those smaller vessels in the arteries. You, you know, the same person that came up with the fight or flight response also talked about voodoo death, where they looked at studying people down in New Orleans many years ago. And if someone thought that a spell or curse was put on them, mm -hmm. that was enough to cause medical conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, I like looking at the mind-body connection. There's someone called uh, Joe Dispenza who looks at neuroplasticity and wrote a book called You Are the Placebo. When you look at studies that uh, include a placebo group, in particular in mental health, probably 30% of the people get better on a placebo, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there's a portion of your brain that's powerful enough to help you heal. Mm -hmm. So um, speaking about voodoo death, I mean, my mother's a medical anthropologist and certainly, and you know, we're, the audience probably gets sick of me saying that I'm of Egyptian descent, but um, she, I mean, people can be, had a curse put on them and if they believe it, and this is not just Africa, there are other um, sort of civilizations and cultures which have it, people do drop dead. And we've heard actually just happened, um, one of my classmates from medical school, uh, his parents died within 15 days of each other. We hear these stories all the time where somebody died of a broken heart, that is real. So I want to now kind of pivot a little bit to post COVID. So Ms. Priscilla, what has happened in terms of your world, food and friends and the food world in general since COVID? What, how has that impacted you? How much time do you have? <laughs> um, in several, several ways. Um, you know, we've seen an increase in just the number of clients that have had to be referred um, clients are staying on service with us for longer, even just the process of recertification, um, getting to their doctor's office, staying in care with their other practitioners has been a challenge for several people because they're not leaving the house um, or they're not able to be seen right now. So that's, you know, that's been a part of, you know, the, the challenges we face with intake and just getting people on service and then recertifying them. Um, 
our whole you know menu planning has changed our deliveries have changed to just one day a week we um you know we've had to factor in shortages from various food vendors even so that affects our menu planning and what we're able to send our clients so yeah COVID has certainly affected all aspects of our um, organization and specifically down to you know our, our food and menu planning and how we are delivering our services mm -hmm. um, across the board. Mm -hmm. So and of course more families are impacted because since school has been closed uh, children uh, don't have the usual meals that they may get, right. uh, not to mention the education, which impacts the social determinants of health and how long a, a child and a human being can live. So there's such a domino effect from the COVID crisis. A um, couple of questions that came up, Dr. Robinson, talk to us please about sleep and heart disease and hypertension. How, how, do, how do those connect? Well, you can, we can use the example of sleep apnea. Um, that's one of the extremes. So people that have sleep apnea, that means that when you have apnea, that means you stop breathing. And you traditionally see that in people with larger neck size, men when they get uh, size 17 inches or greater. But if you have a small airway in the back, large tonsils, you can have sleep apnea as well. Um, it's when you're, you just stop breathing. So every time you stop breathing, it's like producing a fire alarm in your body. So your brain is now looking at low oxygen, producing a lot of adrenaline, and it wakes you up. So you're not having a deep sleep. So the next day you might wake up with headaches. I've, I can't tell how many people I've diagnosed with sleep apnea that have been having this long workup of just headaches. And they've been going to neurologists, they've been going to all these other people, and then you just mm -hmm. have to decide how's your sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're not really sleeping well. The next day they're worn out. Their body's just tired. You know, you wake up with headaches, the mouth's dry, blood pressure can be all through the, through the roof, really. When you see someone that's young, obese, you want to know about their history, their sleep history. And um, that's one of the things you, you go down the list to check to see if they have sleep apnea, um, to, to see if that's influencing their blood pressure. Patients that have arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation and different arrhythmias, you can have people that die of cardiac arrest that have sleep apnea because the adrenaline is really high mm -hmm. in the body itself that can mm -hmm. impact people mm -hmm. that don't get good sleep in with insomnia will have a lot of issues down the line because their next day is ruined it affects their you know cycles it affects their thinking it affects their you know just overall well-being their, mo their, their mood their mood Ooh, that's another yeah. one yeah that's an, uh, so i have sleep apnea uh, fortunately i was diagnosed a while ago um, and I use my CPAP mask, actually in our family, <laughs> my parents, my sister, my brother-in-law, my dad one, one time made a picture with my cats with little <laughs> CPAP masks. <laughs> but all kidding aside, some of the signs of sleep apnea include morning headache and then waking up with an extremely dry mouth and even getting up to urinate several times in the middle of the night. And I find that when I can't control somebody's blood pressure, and in general, when, you know, as a general internist, we ask, your eating, your sleeping, your work environment, your mood, because all of that fits in, in terms of any health conditions, but particularly in heart disease, in heart disease. Right. So COVID is hit. What's COVID doing to the heart? Well, there are several things we can go from head to toe. And the point I really want to make is for the younger people and people that say, oh, we got COVID and it won't affect you. You didn't get really that sick. Look at Real Sports with Brian Gumbel on one of their episodes where he looked at some of the young athletes that had COVID and how it's impacted them down the line. So there are MRI studies that look at the heart after someone's had COVID and still see inflammation in the heart 30 days down the line. It affects blood vessels in many ways, increase your risk of having clots in the blood vessels from the brain, what we call uh, pulmonary embolus, uh, clots in the lungs, clots in the legs, increased heart attack risk. Um, it increases inflammation throughout the body. And inflammation is a, a, one of those precursors to cardiovascular disease causing damage to the blood vessel wall, the heart, the brain. So we you know, have to look at protocols on how do you follow someone who's had COVID. If you have palpitations after COVID, you probably should get an event monitor. One of the monitors that run that you put on 
and you wear it for several days to look for any arrhythmias if you're having that. If you're having symptoms that's, pro, uh, that's prolonged, more shortness of breath, any heart failure symptom like swelling, you probably should get an echocardiogram to make sure you don't have what's called myocarditis or inflammation of the heart that damages the heart. There are many viruses that causes heart failure, but we know that COVID can also cause that. There are mm -hmm. inflammatory diseases in children, mm -hmm. Kawasaki's disease or inflammatory vessel disease that you see in kids. I don't think they've truly given a, a true name yet, but uh, it affects the, the body from head to toe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're right. I think it's understandable when you're younger, you think you know everything and that you live forever. And believe me, that's not true. <laughs> um, that's number one. But I think um, I understand why young people are just feeling, you know, really pent up. I mean, I think they've missed so many milestones. Some of them have missed graduation, they've missed parties, they've missed getting together with their friends. And sometimes, you know, as they say, denial is more than a river in Egypt, right? They don't want, if you, if it, if you deny it, it doesn't exist, but the consequences are very high because even if they don't get that sick, and as you pointed out, Dr. Robinson, they can get really, really sick and there are deaths among you know, young people and children, unfortunately. Um, they spread, they're the spreaders um, to everybody else. So going back to you, Ms. Priscilla, what are some of the myths that um, people have around food security or insecurity? I think, you know, if, you're, if you've grown up in a household where, you know, middle class household where you have uh, knives and forks and you know how to crack an egg or you have a refrigerator, um, you assume everybody else does. Is that the case? No, I mean, there are um, a few myths around uh, food insecurity and related, you know, related to your health, as Dr. Robinson mentioned earlier, if you are going to prioritize anything when it comes to, you know, either getting your medications or getting to the doctor's office or transportation or childcare, that often supersedes getting healthy food and getting healthy nutrition or, you know, um, shopping, uh, you know, on a budget, being more budget conscious with food. Um, so oftentimes there's, you know, a, a conflicting priorities with uh, food insecurity versus taking care of uh, one's health. So, yeah, so I, I think that we hear the word food insecurity and we, it's not always a direct link to um, making the choice for poor nutrition. Oftentimes other things are being prioritized that, you know, lead to, um, lead to poor uh, health choices when it comes to nutrition. You have brought up probably one of the most important um, issues that I can speak on behalf of doctors anyway, that is in our absolute blind spot. You know, when somebody comes in and they're not doing what we've asked them to do, um, like we act like sometimes we know everything, um, there is not really the question of what's going on in your life. And so to your point, if people are um, having to take care of multiple generations at home or having to deal with digital education, if they have the computer and if they have uh, the, the actual internet, um, and by the way, after this whole thing is over with COVID, I think we should pay teachers their weight in gold because honest to God, uh, I think that Americans have realized how important they are and a whole bunch of other people like uh, sanitation workers, um, not, I mean, people talk about physicians and nurses, which is great, but really what makes the system um, so important is that we all are important. We're all cogs in a wheel, right? Yes, Dr. Robinson. I want to piggyback on what Scott was saying about the food insecurities, but there's a group that we forget to actually even think about when we're always talking about health equity and things like that. I've given talks at large groups with large groups of people that were affluent mm -hmm. in our communities. And when you check their blood pressures, probably three fourths of them are elevated mm -hmm. and overweight. So there's mm -hmm. one of those deadly sins of obesity and gluttony that it's not just in, you know, certainly we, we know about what's happening, what's happening in the poor uh, communities, but also in our more wealthy communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there are uh, people in certain groups that mm -hmm. are just not, 
cutting it and uh, have rip roaring hypertension and the complications mm -hmm. of hypertension. Mm -hmm. and Thank, you for, well. Thank you for pointing that out because you're right. We talk about uh, different minoritized and under-resourced communities, but really uh, just because you have the money doesn't necessarily guarantee that you don't struggle with these issues, right? And if I just might want to point out, we have a wonderful organization, a wonderful not-for-profit called WANDA. Um, this is, and Ms. Ashanti, please tell me the woman's name, put it in the chat, because I can't believe that uh, I've forgotten. But, but this organization started by a dietitian or maybe a nutritionist, um, basically focuses on African-American health it's, and, and, and nutrition. So if you visit her website, you'll see just a lot of information. She even has a, a book for children. But I, what I learned from her is among the very, very obese, overweight, and I hate that word, by the way, obese, but fat um, uh, African-American women, one in two has suffered uh, sexual trauma. Now that's a horrible, horrible statistic. So what do we do as healthcare, the healthcare system? You need to lose weight. You need to stop, you know, eating junk food, you, 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 right? We're adding to the trauma instead of really, why are you eating? What's happening? I mean, food can be comfort, right? I mean, food is a basic need, but you know, I mean, the COVID-19 that I'm seeing my patients now gaining 19 pounds, that's real because people of course are more sedentary, but a lot of people are anxious and they use food there. So uh, root cause analysis in any condition I think is, is clear. There was another question that, oh, I'm sorry, please go ahead. And you also have to treat it as a condition. Exactly, so we exactly. Don't, we don't give it its due as a quote disorder or a disease process, which has probably 20, 30 different things that uh, are like spokes in a wheel that come off of obesity, mm -hmm. uh, being overweight. So yep. really putting a face into that and the downstream complications of it to people and how important it is. Yeah, I see that Ms. Ashanti has put in the chat the website. So there's a question that's come up about how severe does the diabetes or the high blood pressure need to be before it impacts your heart? Well, it's usually the, the chronicity of it. When you think about diabetes, it doesn't have to be rip roaring diabetes where you're in what we call ketosis and in the hospital with an insulin drip. It's just that standard. That's why you look at the A1C. That's a marker of your average di uh, blood sugars. And over time, that blood sugar level can in, in some of the end products can affect your blood vessels. When you think about hypertension, they've lowered the numbers because of this same question uh, down to 120 over 80 and start calling it hypertension 130 over 90 not because they want to put you on medications, because we know when you start getting to that 140 over 90, you can start getting damage to the eyes, to the blood vessel. And the analogy I like to use, if someone squirts you with a water gun, that doesn't hurt. But if I turn a fire hydrant hose on you, that over time can thicken your skin and then rip your skin. And that's what blood pressure is doing to you over time, to the vessels of the eyes, to the brain, to the heart. Think about bench pressing. The top number of blood pressure is when you push up like this. The bottom is when you try to bring it down and relax. It. So mm -hmm. imagine if your heart's doing that 10 or 20,000 times a day against heavy pressure. It has to compensate by getting thicker. That's the first stage of heart failure. Then it gets stiffer. Then it starts to tear and, and then it progresses to an irreversible form. Same mm -hmm. thing happens in the kidney. So it doesn't have to be extremely high. Well, and what is that um, example that people use if, if water keeps dripping, right? It can, you know, erode a stone. I see that there's another question from the chat and asking about COVID and can COVID directly attack heart valves? And um, especially in people who have repaired heart valves, is there a relationship there? Well, as of yet, I haven't seen a, you know, major studies on that. In particular, it's looking more at the, the muscle itself and causing inflammation of the muscle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a question that maybe I will take, and that is, um, does uh, an A1C of 6.0 require medication? So it depends. So just to go through what an A1C is and what the numbers are, A1C, as Dr. Robinson mentioned, is what your glucose has been running over a period of time, two to three months. 
think of the glucose that you get checked in a doctor's office as just being a picture. The A1C is like a little video clip. It gives you an idea of what your glucose has been running over time. So what is considered pre-diabetes or what's normal is a number of less than 5.6. Pre-diabetes is when it's 5.6 to 6.4. Above 6.4 is when you have diabetes. So is six that number, does it require medication? Well, it depends. If you are 85, absolutely not because your life expectancy, 15, 20 years, that's okay. And the, and the damage that can be done by taking medication where you faint or you pass out is much more on the heart and the brain than having a glucose that's a teeny bit high. As a matter of fact, in our elderly patients, and I take care of a lot of them, we can let A1Cs go up as high as eight. And we're okay with that because we just don't want the, the problem of having too low of a blood glucose because the effects on the heart and the brain are so damaging. Now, if you are 20 and you have an A1C of six to the analogy and all that the, Dr. Robinson is mentioning, that over time is not good at all. So with young people that have type one diabetes, which comes from a virus attacking the pancreatic cells, we really like to see A1Cs in the four and a half to five, right? Uh, so if, if you're a middle-aged, whoever asked that question, uh, 6.0 is pretty good. Um, so let me see some other responses here. I see well, some more I chats. I want to mention when you said the blood sugar being too low, blood pressure can be too low in the elderly as well, right? So someone that's 80 or 90 or who's had a stroke, they may not need a blood pressure in the 120 range. It could be too low for them. It could precipitate dementia or it could cause them to pass out more frequently. So they may need a little higher blood pressure mm -hmm. to pump blood, for, blood flow through those smaller blood vessels in the brain. Mm -hmm. There's a, a couple of questions that came up on, on chat. Uh, we'll start with you, um, um, Ms. Priscilla. What can people do to support food and friends during the COVID pandemic? So a, a few things, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, all healthcare practitioners, if, you know, it's just a matter of spreading the word within the community that we exist as a service, um, connecting people who need our services um, with us, helping to identify them um, first and foremost. Also just giving of your time. We are still very much a fully functioning um, facility. We do still take volunteers, so even um, coming in uh, either individually or with groups, um, much smaller groups these days, but just, you know, coming in and helping out to volunteer, um, you know, uh, financial uh, support as well in the form of donations is also appreciated, but, you know, several things you can do to help support us. So I know that uh, every year um, pre-COVID, the cardiology section at GW headed by um, Dr. Richard Katz goes as a group to volunteer, mm -hmm. um, packing food and so forth. And what's great is that you also have educational programs for younger people so that you, know, you, can, uh, you can learn a lot. And it's something when you see Food and Friends and just say, wow, you guys are angels on earth. So there's another question for you, Dr. Robinson, that comes from the chat. And it's about AFib. And it says, can you explain AFib? Um, tell us, what is AFib? So there are a bunch of different, what we call arrhythmias or supraventricular tachycardia coming from the meaning fast rhythms coming from the top of the heart. So atrial fibrillation in particular comes from the top left side of the heart where the blood flow comes in from the lungs back into the, into the heart uh, itself. And it's an irregular rhythm. So I can, you know, the, the analogy I use, if I cut the light switch on, it's gonna go up a bundle of wires and cut a light on. But if you look at your ceiling, you might see a little, a bunch of little holes in the ceiling. If you have one of those tile ceilings in, in a business, in, an op, in, a, in a business or in the exam room, all those little dots in the ceiling can be sources of electricity. So imagine mm -hmm. if all of those are firing at different times the light's gonna be flickering. It's not gonna be regular like this. So you have all of this going on from the top and that's calling the bottom of the heart to do that as well. There are a couple of things that atrial fibrillation we worry about when someone goes into atrial fibrillation. And a lot of times you don't feel it unless it's real fast. It may be as subtle as you feel more tired or more short of breath than usual, but there's a little pouch in the top of the heart. So when the heart's not completely emptying, 
and it's just doing like that, blood can become stagnant in one of these little crevices. And when it becomes stagnant, it can form a clot that breaks off and cause a stroke. That's one of the issues that we worry about. So you see all these commercials with Xarelto and Eliquis, uh, some of the blood thinners that we use to decrease the risk of someone having a stroke. The other thing it, it, it could do is if it's going too fast and uncontrolled, can cause the heart to weaken or what we call the cardiomyopathy. So we try to control the heart rate with certain medications. And there are a bunch well, of ways you can try to get you out of it. So the sooner, the better, the longer you're in it, the likelihood of getting someone out of it and maintaining their regular rhythm goes down lower. Mm -hmm. So I like to, thank you for that. That's a great explanation. And, and what I like to remind people is that the heart really has four different systems, if you will. There's the electrical system, and that's why people, when it doesn't do well or, you know, gets like the wires get frayed, you know, that you can need a pacemaker or that the atrial fibrillation can happen. Then there are actually the heart valves that open and close, and there can be issues there. You've got the heart muscle, right? And then finally, you've got the blood vessels that actually feed um, the heart. And so that's why when we talk about heart disease, there's so much. That's why, how many extra years of training did you have to do for, uh, for cardiology? You did your three years of internal medicine and how much more, Dr. Robinson? Three years for cardiology. And we, we have, I'm a general contractor. We have our electricians, we have, <laughs> we have our plumbers that deal with the plumbing or the arteries. And then we have our, uh, our um, carpenters. Those are the surgeons that do the surgery on the heart itself. Great. So uh, in wrapping up, I just want to make sure that we got to all the questions and comments. Um, oh, isn't that nice? This is from Dr. Collins, who is one of our fine nephrologists and my former chief resident. Says, great program. Always wonderful to see my favorite doc. Oh, I guess he's talking about me. Also good to see <laughs> Dr. Robinson, my brother from the 100 Black Men. I have learned a lot today. And uh, uh, Ms. Priscilla, you're still taking volunteers. Um, I see you put in the chat, that's wonderful. So in wrapping up, um, we've got about four more minutes. Uh, I'm sure there are things that I didn't ask you about. So I'm gonna give you um, the floor first, uh, Ms. Dawes. What else do you want people to know about either food and friends or food and heart disease or your program? What would you like everybody to know? Yeah, so I'll, you know, finish off with, um, you know, to echo what both of you have been saying tonight about COVID increasing stress levels and how much that affects heart health, but stress and diet are very connected as well. Um, oftentimes when we're under a tremendous amount of stress, which most of us have been this past year, um, we look to food to provide relief. Um, unfortunately, usually this means, you know, disordered eating, overeating, reaching for comfort foods, you know, generally, items, these items are higher in sugar and, and fat and salt. Um, so all these things in excess, you know, per Dr. Robinson's um, mention of all of the other co-occurring illnesses that affect heart health, you know, can lead to weight gain, added stress on the heart, and all of those other health issues, which then in turn leads to more stress. So it ends up becoming a vicious cycle. And I think what we need to do is kind of reframe what stress relief looks like and what comfort foods mean to us and you know be you know be more mindful of reaching for healthier options um, i know it's tough now but you want to allow yourself to treat yourself every once in a while but being mindful of you know what all of those um those unhealthy items can do and how they can add up over time so mm -hmm. just wanted to put that out there because you know stress does affect how we eat um, so much for sure Thank you, Ms. Dawes. Your final word goes to Dr. Robinson. Anything else that you'd like to add? So, you know, with, when you look at cardiovascular health and health overall, it's TLC or total lifestyle change. Mm, I like that. There's no one magic bullet. Um, I love using analogies and I say it all the time when I ask patients, what is their favorite gas station? Mm -hmm. And they don't tell me. They have specific gas stations and they have specific type of gas that they'll put in their car. And I'll ask them, why don't they put diesel in their car? Because mm -hmm. they know that'll ruin their car. But then when you ask them, why don't they think the same about what they put in their body? Mm -hmm. Treating their body as on par or better than they treat their car because without your health, none, nothing else in the world really matters. That's right. 
That's right. And I just want to also acknowledge that the faith-based community has done a wonderful job um, in terms of, uh, I see that there's another final, final question uh, of educating uh, uh, people. There's actually, Dr. Robinson, please answer the question in the question answer box, which I don't know where that is. Um, I guess it's one more question, but as we're trying to figure, oh, I didn't see that, sorry. You know, th these, these things are great, but uh, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, like how can, yes, but how can you tell if there's a blood clot versus just a varicose vein or a stiff joint? Okay, um, that can be sort of tricky sometimes. And I'll share my own story that I, did a medical mission to Ethiopia in January. And it's a long flight, as you can imagine. And I um, got in one of the seats where I can recline, get up, move around, and I do Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu. So when I got back, I thought my left leg, and I, I just pulled something. So I kept stretching it and stretching it and pain didn't go away. And then I kept looking at my legs to see if there was any size difference. And there was a minimal size difference. Mm -hmm. So I had my staff to just do an ultrasound and I could look at it and see that I had a DVT in my lower, lower extremity. So I went on Eloquist. Wow. Uh, Deep vein thrombosis is right, DVT. Clot, clot in the leg. So it could be as simple as clot, uh, pain in the calf muscle. Um, if you see asymmetry, meaning one leg is bigger than the other, that shouldn't, mm -hmm. that's one of the things you want to, varicose veins shouldn't do that unless you have really bad varicose veins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The size difference that could be one of the triggers that you want to go and get an ultrasound of the leg. Mm -hmm. and, and how I'm, are you doing? How are you doing now? I'm doing fine. I'm doing Good. fine. I'm so glad to hear people, that. Since we are home and doing all these Zoom meetings and calls, you have to get up. Remind yourself to get up every hour. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. there are risk factors for having a DVT just sitting eight hours a day mm -hmm. looking at the computer screen. Okay. So um, we, I think we've answered everything. Um, let me see. Good. Somebody, somebody, I think your, the question was answered. I always like to make sure everybody's attended to. So I invite everybody to visit our different websites, um, whether it's the Rodham Institute, whether it's the Food and Friends. And Dr. Robinson, do you have a website? It's American on, Heart Association? Well, it's just on MedStar. But if you want more information about cardiovascular disease, certainly go to the American Heart Association's website. Okay, and if you are not already signed up for our listserv, please sign up. We've got a newsletter that goes out twice a, twice a month, and then you can learn about these activities and also reach out to us if there are topics that you would like to hear uh, about. We've had over 40 webinars since March, since the beginning of COVID. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot, but there we may have some areas that we need to learn more about. So Dr. Robinson, Ms. Dawes, Thank you so much on behalf of the Rodham Institute. We really enjoyed having you here and everybody stay safe, stay healthy. And remember that when the vaccine comes becomes available uh, to try to get it. And if you're still kind of on the fence, go to the black coalition against covid.org to learn more. All right, good night, everybody. <laughs> thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. Appreciate you, bye-bye.